Good afternoon. My name is Megan LaPointe. I am the Senior Associate Director of Alumni Relations. It is my pleasure to welcome you to today's webinar, Marine Biology, Ecology, and Climate Change. As you know, we're committed to keeping our alumni and friends engaged with St. Anselm by partnering with our centers, institutes, other departments on campus, and our alumni. We'll continue to offer webinars, podcasts, and other opportunities to stay connected. I am so impressed with the variety of programs offered this past year, and it is thanks to many people who have offered their expertise or suggested a topic. I would encourage you to contact the Alumni Relations Office if you have suggestions for future programs. Today's webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the college's website for those who couldn't make it live. Our panel will speak for about 30 minutes and then we'll take questions. There's a Q&A button on your screen. Please feel free to submit questions. Today's discussion will be led by our three panelists, Kane Malio, class of 2015, and Dr. Lori LaPlante and Dr. Teresa Tabrusi from the biology department. They will each take a few minutes to introduce themselves. Kane, would you like to start? All right. Well, so I'm Kane Malio, and I'm from the class of 2015. And for the last six years out of college, I've been working in the commercial fishing industry. And I'm gonna show you guys what that's been like. All right. So I spent, as soon as I graduated from college, first job I got was for working for the National Marine Fishery Services. And I, as a fisheries observer, going out on commercial fishing boats. <clears throat> and if you told me going out of college I was going to be working on boats, I would have called you a liar because I did not see myself doing that. Um, so to start, commercial fishing is the most dangerous job that we have in the United States. And <clears throat> because of that, this job is very, very intense. So let's see. So you guys have seen Deadliest Catch and you can fake all the drama on that show, but what you can't fake is the weather. So I'm gonna jump right in and show you guys the most common type of fishing that I covered <clears throat> my last five years, which is trawling. So, I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. So this is commercial trawling, and what we're doing here is we're dragging a net behind the boat in the middle of the water column, and they're catching pollock. And they're catching pollock by the hundreds of thousands of pounds at a time. <clears throat> You're gonna see them pulling up the net here. Full of pollock. And it is a long, long process. So they were dragging this net behind the boat for a few hours. And the pollock industry is actually the largest fishery in the world. And we're only catching pretty much one species here, and that's called the walleye pollock. And I'll show you right away. What are the... So we're fishing, and we're catching this pollock, and we're catching it in a monstrous amount. That's why they have people like me for this marine biologist job. I'm there to take data and everything that they're catching in this massive amount of volume. You'll see, as you can see, it's just one species of fish here. And that's good, that's what you're aiming for, a nice clean catch. And that's why midwater fishing is very efficient. I'm gonna switch and show you a different type of trawling. So again, they're dragging this net behind the boat and catching everything in their path. And these nets are tens of thousands of pounds and the opening of the net is over 200 feet. So everything that's in its path, it's gonna catch. Uh, so these nets don't select for size or species. So when you're trawling on the bottom of the floor of the ocean, you're catching everything in its path. So that's where, <clears throat> that's where my job comes in. So I'm going to pause this for a second. You, you can see here the vast uh, amount of species of fish. So you see some eels, you see midwater fish, you see flatfish, there's rockfish, there's skates, there's crab. So this net caught absolutely everything. <clears throat> 
Let's see. And we're just about to reset it. <laughs> so, since these nets are catching everything, and I'm the one marine biologist on the boat, I have to come up with a way to sample what's in this net randomly and figure out what is the entire composition of the net. So, there's a couple ways to do that. And again, I'm going to pull this back up so you can see. Oh, wait a second. So again, they're pulling this net up and they're dumping this net slowly into the boat. So I'm randomly taking samples throughout it to test for the composition of the fish. I'm figuring out what species are there, we're figuring out how much of the species is there. Um, I'm taking biological samples. So for each different fish, we need different data because we're collecting different data to figure out the age structures and different population dynamics of each species. So because of that, there's different types of sampling I'm doing for each species. Um, for some fish I'll take otoliths, which is their little ear bones. And we'll send those into a lab and look at them under a microscope. <clears throat> and we'll be able to tell the age of the fish. Some fish we take stomachs because it's really important to know what they're eating and if they have enough of it. <clears throat> and then some fish will take whole samples just because they're way out of their um, where they live, their, <clears throat> their range. And let's see. So this next video, I'm going to show you is another type of fishing, but unlike the active fishing that I just showed you of dragging the net behind the ocean to catch all the fish, this is called a passive form of fishing. So this is commercial long lining. And what these guys are doing is they're setting a baited hook a long line, a two mile long line with baited hooks coming off of that line every six feet. Uh, and they're trying to catch halibut. And they're laying this on the bottom of the ocean floor and they're going back to pick it up like four to six hours later after they get some sleep and <clears throat> hoping that there's fish on the other end of the line. Now, this is a super interesting fishery, and you might have heard it in the news because they're constantly battling with the orcas, which is the killer whales up there. Um, so just like we've adapted with our gear to catch fish efficiently, uh, orcas have adapted as well to catch fish with very, very minimal energy usage. And because of that, uh, these orcas will wait outside of the harbor, listen to the sounds of boats, they'll be able to tell which one's a longliner, and they'll follow them out, and as they fish, they'll predate on their lines. So as soon as you start pulling up your gear and you see an orca in the distance, you can take a bet that you're not gonna get any fish that day because the orca will come, it'll hold its mouth right on the line and strip all the fish that it can. So we're seeing more and more of these marine mammal interactions <clears throat> and it's becoming pretty interesting because now these fishermen aren't really sure what to do, especially when, uh, I mean, you can't do anything against a protected species, <laughs> especially one that's quickly adapting. But going back to these samples, one of the biggest things that uh, St. Ace helped me with was figuring out <clears throat> uh, species identification. One of my favorite classes I took there was the ornithology class in Dr. J's, and he taught us how to use dichotomous keys to figure out which species um, of which bird are we looking at or dissecting and that is huge in this job. Um, one of the big tests you have to pass is dichotomous key test and that's just figuring out which fish is which fish because depending on minute details that can separate species. <laughs> uh, so this is a video blog lining still. This is what it looks like when they actually pull up the fish. So this is a video perspective of the guy who's catching the fish. He's looking off the side of the boat. And then the long line is slowly coming up right at his feet. 
That's oop. I meant to pause it. And you can see that fish with its hook in its mouth being pulled right along. And it's about go to go through a crucifier, which is two pieces of metal. So the hook gets pulled through and it takes the hook out of the fish's mouth and deposits it right in the table so it can be sampled. <clears throat> but because of this, there's a good amount of carnage. Um, things that come up and obviously have a hook ripped through their mouths don't necessarily survive all the time. Uh, just like with trawling, when you're pulling this net up from 200, 300 meters down in the ocean, everything coming up is pretty much dead. So that's why it's so important to get accurate data on what we're killing so we can keep track of these populations of fish. That being said, we have all, my job is mainly there for the bycatch. So I'm figuring out, so by bycatch, I mean fish that we're catching and species that we're catching that we weren't targeting, so we weren't trying to catch. So these are a few examples of bycatch around the oceans. Uh, there's a tiger rockfish on the left. In the middle is a blue shark, which actually pulled up for the first time over the summer in Alaska, which uh, out of the Bering Sea, which the blue shark are just starting to enter the Bering Sea now because of the warming waters. <clears throat> and then we have sculpin babies up there. Those are very, very small fish. So you can see that's what I mean by those nets don't select by size. Those came out of a bottom trawl net. So even though the fish is less than two inches, it was still being caught just in that mass of fish and pulled up and obviously killed at the surface. And then there's Atka mackerel, which is a big glowing yellow fish. Oh, and here's a little bit more. Here's a lingcod. <clears throat> Another top predator in the ocean in Alaska. <clears throat> and then the, everyone's favorite part of the job, which is the marine mammal inverted reactions. So <clears throat> I get to deal a lot with top predators working in Alaska. And some of those top predators are bother us on land and at sea. So as you can see here, there's a sea lion that was climbing up the back of the boat looking for fish. And this is a pretty common occurrence in Alaska. These guys are all sea lions crabbing around the boat. And you can see, uh, so even though we're not at sea, we're still having a pretty big impact on these uh, predators around the port and um, not even just where we're fishing. And this definitely changes the food chain. <clears throat> now we have these top predators like bald eagles that are coming out of nowhere, all congregated on these boats. You pretty fun fish that's already caught and dead on deck. So these top predators almost turned into scavengers, pretty much turned into scavengers. In the and it's pretty amazing to see. But uh, that brings me to the hot topic, which is the future of our oceans. <clears throat> so we're seeing lots of changes over the years. Um, just with this job, I mean, I've seen our oceans change. So I didn't give you enough of the background, but I've been in this industry for six years. And my first two years, I worked all along the East Coast. Um, and on the East Coast, I covered ports from Maine to South Carolina. And just in the two years that I worked out there, we were seeing the oceans change. Uh, for example, I went on a trip out of New Jersey and we found a tropical fish in one of our halls that was 4,500 miles out of, its, uh, out of its range of where it should be. And this is because of the increasing her, uh, intensity of the hurricane, just carrying fish farther. Um, warming waters, it's just all this is adding to the same problem. Uh, in Alaska, we're seeing hot spots pop up in the ocean now, and that's messing up migrations of pollock, migrations of salmon. Um, we're seeing a disruption in those migrations because once they hit those hot spots, those fish are pretty much lost. They can't find their original rivers or spawning areas that they're supposed to go to. 
Uh, on the East Coast, we're seeing an increase in sh uh, shark populations and shark migrations north. Uh, uh, you guys probably know, but in Maine, our last year we had our last, uh, or last summer, we had the first fatal shark attack in Maine. And that's not a coincidence. I mean, we're going to be having, I have a feeling we'll have more in the future, I'm sure, with the more and more big sharks coming up the coast. And uh, yeah, so when Alumni Relations reached out to me and asked me to present today, I was all for it because I had no idea about this job in industry before I graduated St. A's. And the fact that two months after getting out of college, I was riding on these boats out on the Atlantic Ocean with all these fishermen, it was an absolutely crazy feeling. And uh, I would recommend it for everyone because at this point, there's going to be so many jobs growing having to do with our oceans. Uh, I don't think marine biology is that big of a stretch to get into anymore, but let's see. All right, and that's all I have. Great, thank you, Kane. And Dr. Lori LaPlante, would you like to speak? Oh, Laura, you're muted. Okay, there we go. <laughs> you would think after two semesters of working remotely, I'd have this down. <laughs> but yeah, so um, I'm a professor of biology and uh, I've been at St. A's for about 16, 17 years. And originally I am from California and became interested in marine biology really early on. I spent a lot of time at the beach, more so than I probably should have. And I would go visit my grandparents who lived down in San Diego. And like one of the best sort of memories that I have is going to SeaWorld where you could buy these little paper baskets with fish in it and you could feed the dolphins. And I remember that just being, you know, the highlight of my weekend. When I turned 17, I got my scuba diving certificate and that pretty much sealed it for me. I took every opportunity to be part of the marine environment. I was pretty much hooked at that point. So I ended up going to um, California State University, Long Beach and enrolled in the marine biology program there and eventually went on to graduate school at University of Connecticut. I had two main criteria for working on my dissertation in graduate school. One was that I wanted to be able to scuba dive for my research. And the second was I wanted to be able to travel. So I was asked to talk about some of the cool critters and research and projects that I worked on. So one of the first projects that I worked on when I was at UConn was looking at tautog. Um, and we wanted to know how many eggs do female tautog produce in a season? So shown here is a picture of tautog. They're temperate water, so you can find them off of the coast um, of Massachusetts and further south, all the way up to Canada even. They're in the RAS family, so they're actually cousins to, if you think about cleaner RASs, the ones that you see on all of those documentaries. So these are cousins to them, but as you can see in the picture, much bigger. They're really popular with recreational and commercial fishermen because they've got mild flaky white meat, and they're also quite predictable where they're going to be. They spend a lot of time near shore. So as a result of this, their populations have been declining. In Long Island Sound, there's a power plant off of the coast of Connecticut, Milford Power Plant. And they were interested in understanding what kind of an impact they may be making on the tautog populations. Because um, at power plants, tautog eggs float and the eggs can be pulled into the entrainment of the, the intakes for the power plant and obviously wouldn't survive after that. So that's pretty much where I began my research as a graduate student. To figure this out, we had to collect females from the field. We had to then remove their ovaries and count their eggs. And it turns out that collecting tautog in the field was extremely challenging. It's to get an idea of how many eggs a female produces in an entire season, we had to collect females throughout the season because egg production varies depending on female size and also during the time of the year. So ideally, we needed to catch a variety of female sizes. So we needed about 20 females of various sizes every two weeks for the four months during their reproductive period. 
I spent the first several weeks trying to catch Tautog by setting fish traps and fishing with rod and wheel. Uh, rod and reel, it's really not as fun as it sounds, especially because I pretty much the amount of time I spent doing this, I did not produce very many fish at all. I wish I would have had that trawl that Kane was just talking about. Um, plus, I was actually catching more males than females, and so that was just kind of wasted effort because I only needed the females. And you could tell females from males in Tautog because they have different shapes and they have different colors. And even when I did catch females, they tended to be similar in size. So I wasn't really getting that broad range of sizes that I needed. It turns out the most efficient way to collect females in the field, at least for this project, was to put on cold water scooper gear and arm myself with a spear gun. By doing this, I was able to collect a wide variety of female sizes. I could narrow my target to just females and it turned out to be a really effective way overall. So in this overall study, what we did find was, you know, the take home message from the study was, it's important to protect the large size females if you want the population to replenish at a faster rate. For example, a three-year-old female might produce a million eggs per year, but a nine-year-old female who's almost twice as large will produce 55 million eggs per year. And so protection of large females then is really critical for population recovery. And this is important because if you fish at all, you often hear that you know, there's minimum size catches, right? Because they wanna protect the juveniles. But what we were showing is, is it's like, it's even more important actually to protect some of the large female individuals because they're gonna replenish the population you know, much, much more quickly. And Tata, Kane mentioned climate change. Tata are actually quite vulnerable to climate change. They are found around mussel beds and rocky reefs. Their favorite food is mussels. And with warming oceans and increased acidification, this causes the shells of mussels to weaken, which makes the mussels more vulnerable to other predators and probably less available to Tautog. So one of the things that's really quite fascinating where we are right now is that the Gulf of Maine is one of the fastest warming parts of the entire global ocean. And so the Tautog populations in the Gulf of Maine in particular are quite vulnerable. And you may wonder, well, won't they just adapt to warming waters? It takes multiple generations for any species or population to adapt to its changing environment. Think about how quickly bacteria can become resistant to antibiotics. This is because bacteria can produce thousands of generations, right, in a matter of hours. But tatog are long lived and they're slow growing. So it takes them three to four years to produce their offspring. And when they do produce offspring, it's only for a few months. And even though they produce millions of eggs per year, a really small fraction of those eggs will become mature fish. So as I was doing my study on Tautog, I noticed that when females were close to spawning, they developed this bright white patch on their side, which you can see in that bottom picture. And it made them really conspicuous in the environment in which they were in. And I began to realize that if you look at a lot of animals, generally the females are pretty drab colored compared to the males. So if you think about the peacock with its beautiful tail, the peahen, which is shown right next to it on the bottom left, is not very spectacular. And this trend is seen throughout the animal, um, throughout all an a lot of animals. So lizards, we see this, we see this of course in a lot of fish. And one of the main reasons for this is because eggs are super valuable and females have evolved to be camouflaged in their environment to protect their eggs from predators. That being said, in some species, such as what I noticed in Tautog, females will risk their cover by changing color, which makes them more conspicuous and vulnerable to predators. So I was really interested in understanding why they were females were doing this. How do these types of mating signals evolve? Involve, uh, evolve. So investigating this question required observations of male and females in their natural environment. And honestly, by this time I'd had enough diving in cold waters in the Gulf of Maine. And so I ended up going to a much warmer place, which Teresa is going to talk about, I'm sure of, is the Indo-Pacific. And I spent three more years in the Indo-Pacific, specifically two in Japan and a year in Australia. 
And there I studied a cousin to Tatag, which is shown here, a small fish called the pink belly wrasse. And I was particularly interested in the development of the red belly of the female, which is shown by that arrow on the bottom, um, which only this red belly only lasted about an hour before she was getting ready to spawn. And spawning is just releasing her eggs into the water column. So I'm gonna talk just briefly about the work that I did at Lizard Island Research Station in Australia, where I was particularly interested in figuring out, are these females producing these kind of pink red bellies to attract the males? So we collected females from the reef. We went out scuba diving and snorkeling. We put nets out. Then we brought them back to the lab. And you can see in the middle and bottom pictures, we then tagged them so that we could identify individuals. So we used different tags in different locations and different colors on the fish. And then we followed around the tagged females recording their behavior and the change in their belly color. This required extensive periods of underwater diving and snorkeling. So I got my wish there and I also got to travel. Um, so what we did find was, yeah, females do in fact signal their readiness to mate, their readiness to spawn by developing this red color. And you can see in the pictures to, um, below that, you know, normally their bellies are white, which if you look at the background makes them pretty camouflaged. But then about 15 minutes before they're getting to mate with the male, they develop this really bright color. They're still rather cryptic, but all that being said, red is, you know, a, a big contrast underwater. So we did I was able to establish that, yes, this was the case, but this wasn't the whole story. During the study, I also noticed a really unusual behavior performed by only the females during the same one hour period. And I called it bobbing behavior, where they kind of bobbed and bounced on the surface of coral. Sometimes it was single female advertising her availability. Sometimes it was multiple females advertising um, synchronously. So it was very interesting. And so that turned out to be another signal, another conspicuous signal besides the red belly color um, in order to attract mates. So Lizard Island was, you know, one of those places that's a lot of marine research stations are pretty remote. And, you know, I lived there for months at a time. It can be pretty isolating and exhausting, although it may not look like that from these pictures. We do the best that we can to keep um, entertained. So we took a lot of leisure time to dive other parts of the reef where some of the larger fish were located. So I got a really good opportunity to see just the beauty of the Great Barrier Reef. Six foot long groupers, four foot long Maori wrasses, reef sharks, and of course, lots and lots of co co um, uh, corals. And so the Great Barrier Reef though, nowadays is under, of course, a lot of stress. And the Great Barrier Reef is really important. It's the largest living structure in the world. There's about 600 plus species of coral, over 1600 species of fish, but there have been severe bleaching events on the reef. The first was recorded in 1998 and since then, and just even in the last several years, four more mass bleaching events have occurred in 2002, 2016, 2017, and 2020. And 2020 so far has been the most severe. And so on the bottom left, you can see a picture. All of those red dots are areas in which there was massive bleaching on the coral reef. So 60%, based on aerial surveys, 60% or more of the reef has been bleached on, on the Great Barrier Reef. And this is pretty much due to greenhouse gases. There's really no secret about that. And this of course is problematic for the reef as an ecosystem, but also it's, there's hundreds of millions of people in developing countries that rely on the reef for food security as well as their livelihood. So nowadays there are some efforts for reef restoration that are showing a lot of promise. So the last thing I'm going to mention is just what students are learning at St. Anselm College in regards to the marine environment. And so um, just last spring, I started a marine biology course. Hopefully I have some of my students out there from the course and it'll be offered again next spring. And we discussed a variety of different topics. They were introduced to a variety of marine environments. Unfortunately, we were planning to go to the tide pools as shown here, but we didn't get to because COVID shut us down. I mean, literally the weekend before or the day before we were gonna go out is when campus closed. So that was very unfortunate. 
But there's also a study abroad course um, that's taught in the country of Belize. It's, it's kind of a shock to people to learn that Belize, just down the coast from us, is the second largest barrier reef in the world, second in size to the Great Barrier Reef. And so we spend some time down in Belize and the main objective of this course is to introduce students to a wide variety of field methods that are used in tropical ecosystems. So for the marine portion of this course, students live on a small five acre island right out on the barrier reef and they learn how to identify different species of coral as well as fish species. They um, collect data on the behavior of damselfish and distribution of Christmas tree worms. They measure the coral reef health as well as the diversity using underwater transects. We also do a survey of birds on a nearby um, nesting key, which has a lot of pelicans and cormorants and boobies. And they also learn about mangrove ecosystems. So we do offer an optional night snorkel on the reef and it turns out that, yeah, they get to do a night snorkel. Oftentimes they are hemming and hawing. I don't know if I wanna do this, but everyone always ends up doing it when, they, when, they, when the time comes. So pretty much that's um, what I've been doing with related to the marine environment and what I'm as really associated with, with uh, St. Ace. So I'll turn this over now to Teresa. Teresa, you're on mute. Sorry, it's going to be an ongoing joke about how none of us can still work the Zoom after months and months and months. <laughs> All right. Hi, everyone. I'm Dr. Teresa DeBruzzi, and I'm relatively new here at St. A's. This is my third year, and I am the resident physiologist. Um, I am classically trained as a comparative ecological physiologist, which I tell my students is just a really fancy way of saying I study how animals work and I study their adaptations to environment. Um, the pictures on the screen are some exaggerated examples, but in reality, animals are designed to work over time of living in an environment and evolving characteristics that enable them to become successful in those environments. And that's the area of interest that I like to study. I'm specifically a comparative physiologist, and this means that I study adaptations across different animal groups. And that may seem a little daunting. Why would you compare frogs and snails and puppy dog tails? But to look at an example, all of these animals on the screen breathe air, and they use different functional morphology and different types of physiology to do so. But by looking at pulmonary adaptation across these animal groups, we're able to see the breadth and the scope of animal adaptation. And while some people still think it's like comparing apples and oranges, it really gives us insight into how animals have adapted to live in specific habitats and how different animals evolve different adaptations to live in the same habitat. More specifically in terms of habitat, I am excited to learn about animals that live in extreme places because they exhibit the most intense and different of adaptations. And my research follows a couple of different themes. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about hardcore physiology because I know it's not an interesting topic for everyone, but in general research arcs, I am really fascinated by animals that are amphibious. So these animals that have adapted to live in two worlds and pay the cost of living in a terrestrial environment, which is very different from an aquatic environment. Um, along those lines, I'm also ex um, excited about water economy. So again, how an organism manages their water budget, especially if they have to juggle between an aquatic and a terrestrial media. Um, I am a metabolism junkie. So anything related to bioenergetics and how much it costs an animal to run and efficiency of running the machine, um, I am all about. And I'm also interested in learning about adaptations animals use to live in low oxygen environments. So hypoxic environments or intertidal areas that experience large fluctuations in oxygen. Um, the theme of this talk is marine biology and climate change. 
all of the research I'm going to talk about today is marine oriented. So I'm a marine biologist at heart, but as we've seen, that means so many different things to so many different people. Marine biology is a really broad scale, broad field. Um, but in terms of climate change, also at heart, I am probably a thermal biologist at best. That is really my specialty. And I'm interested in thermal adaptations and different acclimation strategies that animals use to cope with temperature. Because if you are an ectothermic organism or uh, an organism that requires its temperature from the environment, then temperature has both quality as well as quantity. And we're just used to temperature having that quantity aspect. It's too hot, it's too cold, I'm uncomfortable, and climate change is silly. But to these animals, it has greater meaning, both in their distribution and how much it costs to run their machine. As I mentioned, I'm not going to talk too much about the hardcore physiology, but bottom line is I do cool research in really cool places with cool animals. So if you're going to look at some of the most extreme habitats on the planet, we usually think of things like the Antarctic areas where there's really deep ocean and it's cold all the time and it's high pressure. I think of habitats that experience large fluctuations in different types of factors. So in order to find those places, we have to go to extreme habitats. And those are where all the cool animals that you see on the Discovery Channel live. So for the next couple of slides, I thought I would just show you pictures of the fun animals that I've worked with. I'll briefly talk about some of the studies and how it relates to climate change. And also as a physiologist, I build the majority of my own equipment. So I've got pictures of this wild, wild equipment from Dr. Frankenstein's lab that looks like you couldn't get any data out of it that we have published papers from. So the first place I'm gonna talk about is Dry Tortugas National Park, where I worked with damselfish. Um, just like Dr. LaPlante, the reef fish are so much fun. And they come in fun different colors and the males look different than the females. And in this case, the juveniles look really different than the adults. And damselfish exhibit really unique behavior in that they tend algal gardens along the reef. So in Dry Tortugas National Park, right around the Hurricane Alley area, Every hurricane comes through and it's decimated the reef. So there's not so much reef as there is rubble and their guarding behavior has changed and adapted so that they're now able to make gardens on rubble and they guard them differently than fish that are guarding gardens in the reef themselves. I spent a couple of days in Honduras, literally a couple of days. It was a five day trip total travel on both days. Um, on the in and the out. So we ran a complete experiment in three days in Honduras. Um, there was no plan for this particular experiment. I wanted to go and work with something in the mangrove. I knew that there would be amphibious critters there. I was hoping for some amphibious fish, um, but I knew there would be crabs. The people that went with me were like, what are we gonna work with? And I said, I don't know, we'll know when we get there. And we got on the ground, went to the mangrove. We captured, captured a bunch of these little sasarma crabs, put them in little jars, measured their breathing rate and their respiration to determine their metabolism. We also did some heat experiments with them so to determine um, their temperature tolerance. And this is an area that we are already seeing impacts of climate change in terms of um, the habitat being lessened and tidal amplitude being more extreme as we see changes in the climate. I got to live in Vietnam for a month. I lived in um, Southern Vietnam at Cantel University. And there I took a couple of uh, classes that were kind of like workshops on how to work with the local fish of the Mekong Delta. Um, really cool adaptations of these fish. A lot of them breathe air and a lot of them are food staples. So we did some experiments, learned how to work with the fish, learned some microsurgery, which was really fun. But as we left Southern Vietnam and moved to Northern Vietnam, everywhere we stopped along the way was serving the fish we worked with. So I thought that was kind of a fun photo of those really large garami. Um, all of the fish that we worked with are all part of the aquaculture facilities in the area, and they're learning to grow and culture these fish, so hopefully it'll create less demand on the oceans in those parts of the country. Moving on to Malaysia. Malaysia is a trip that I stopped at on the way in and out of Indonesia, which will be the next topic and where I spend the majority of my summers. Um, we spent a couple of days in Malaysia to work with mudskippers and mudskipper fish are so much fun because they live that amphibious lifestyle, the cost of living in two worlds, and they have adaptations that allow them to survive both on the land and in the water pretty much indefinitely. So there's nothing like chasing after a fish and then having it get out of the water and chase after you. Buckets of fun if you ever have the chance. 
Um, this particular experiment was looking at water economy. So how does a fish able to survive on land without completely drying up and turning into a potato chip? And this is some of the examples of our really Frankenstein equipment that we'll get into. I ran the same experiment on some saltwater frogs in Indonesia. So Indonesia is where I've spent, with the exception of last summer and this summer, the last 10 summers of my life. I um, spent the time in Southeast Sulawesi at a small island called Hoga Island within the Wakatobi Marine Preserve. Lots of cool things about island life, but especially the ecology. Um, Hoga Island's got a lot of particular animals that are specific to that area of the Indo-Pacific, um, but one of the unique animals that's there is the saltwater frog. If you know anything about frogs, you know they're amphibious, they live that really cool lifestyle, but you also know they are not tolerant of salt water. And this part of the world has saltwater frogs that are able to withstand 100% seawater. And we even find them in the tidal pools in hypersaline areas. So these are frogs that are super salt tolerant. And we're curious about how these animals that go in and out of the water, as well as in and out of the salt water, are able to deal with their water economy and balance their water budget. I feel like Indonesia has all of the cool animals that you work with when you watch the Discovery Channel. Um, one of my favorites and the most beautiful of animals that I've probably worked with is the blue spotted whiptail stingray. These guys are bright, bright gold and have these neon blue spots speckled across them. They're absolutely brilliant. And although they look like they'd stand out in a crowd of anywhere, they are perfectly camouflaged when they sit in the seagrass beds. So they are impossible to catch until you step on them and then you've already lost. So I've employed a couple of fishermen to help me catch the animals for this research project. And you can see this piece of equipment we have out on the back porch with a series of lights underneath this weird trough-like device. This is actually a temperature preference chamber that I've collect, uh, created. And all of the equipment that we have on Hoga, we had to bring. So imagine bringing this in a suitcase. It's completely detachable. You can see we've used PVC, our favorite of the um, equipment pieces in the marine bio world. And we've riveted pieces of tin roof to make the trough. And we've used lights that I've daisy chained together and hooked up to the circuit on our side of the lab so that we can adjust the temperature within the trough. And we can look at the preferred temperature of the stingray as it swims across the, um, the barricade. Another cool amphibious animal I work with is the yellow lip sea crate. Um, we find them throughout the Indo-Pacific, so Dr. LaPlante might have seen them when she was diving in other places in that part of the world. Um, they're really common. There's a lot of them. They lead that amphibious lifestyle, spend about half the time at sea hunting for fish and half the time on land, brooding eggs and healing and sloughing skin. Um, for those of you that are keeping score, the yellow lip sea crate is the second most venomous of the sea crates. Um, they are in the same family as the mambas and the cobras. If you've got to work with a venomous snake, I would choose the yellow lip sea crate. They're fairly good natured as far as venomous snakes go. And because they breathe in the air and breathe in the water, we created this bimodal respirometer so that we could measure their breathing across their lung surface as well as across their skin. Also from Indonesia, I've worked with many species of lionfish. And if you know anything about lionfish, you probably know that they are the first successful marine invader to alienate the Western Atlantic. Um, they are very good at it and they're apex predators on the reef. So they run around and just eat everything in sight and they are decimating um, the ecology on this side of the planet. These animals are very likely to, influ uh, to be influenced by climate change in terms of expanding the range of areas that they shouldn't be in, particularly as an invasive. Um, the picture that you see of the equipment is another temperature preference chamber I built. This one's out of styrofoam, again, so it could fit in a suitcase to bring it to Indonesia. Um, and while these are tropical fish and like the warm water, we have felt for a long time that they would be deterred by cooler climates. And we find out that they are not so deterred as we once thought. So the fact that they have a preference for cooler water compiled by the fact that our warm waters are gonna continue to increase in the latitudes, we think that lionfish are gonna continue to be a problem on this coast and their range is gonna expand. I've also worked with air breathing fish in Indonesia, lots of different species, both mud skippers and rock skippers. We have these really unique habitats built for them, again, out of styrofoam so that they're easy to move and lightweight. 
Um, but this allows them an aerial as well as an aquatic habitat while we're acclimating them for temperature experiments. Really cool thing about these air breathing fish is their temperature tolerance is different in air than it is in water. And it changes as we acclimate them to different temperatures. So in terms of shifts in the global climate, we believe that these animals are already living close to their maximum capacity, meaning that they have acclimated as much as they're gonna be able to for the long run. So those shallow water areas along the mangrove where these fishes live are really a concern in terms of the global climate change and habitat um, conservation over the next couple of years. I think I might've mentioned that I am a metabolism junkie and anything that you can put a respirometer into a respirometer or a jar that measures respiration, I'm gonna put an animal in it. Indonesia has got the most beautiful of nudibranch species. Um, I'm starting to get familiar with the ecology here in New England and we have beautiful nudibranch species too and they're going in a jar and I'm gonna measure how much they breathe. But such a diversity amongst nudibranchs in this part of the world, it's so beautiful, so much fun. The last of the critters I'm gonna talk about are critters that I feel are near and dear to everyone's heart. Everyone loves the cephalopods. We love the octopus. They're so smart, they can read, they do cool things. Um, they are pretty interesting and we know amazingly little about their physiology. Um, in terms of the cephalopods that are on the other side of the planet, I've got access to a lot of them. I've been really lucky. I've been able to work with the blue ring octopus um, everything on the other side kind of comes in miniature in that island style of life. So we have dwarf cuttlefish that are itty bitty. We have pygmy squid, which are also itty bitty, and a couple of other small octopus species that we've been able to put in the jar and measure how much they breathe, as well as look at those hypoxic relationships. They all live in the shallow inner tidal. So as they wander around in the tide at night looking for food, um, we're able to measure how much it costs to run them, as well as how well adapted they are at handling those low oxygen conditions. And I thought I would end with a couple of statements and uh, pictures about what's going on here at St. A's in terms of my world and what I'm working on here. Um, I am planning to continue to go to Indonesia the next couple of years. And I have a really strong relationship with a university in Makassar um, in Southeast Sulawesi. So I've been speaking with them. And even though things are on hold, we're really excited to start some collaboration and hopefully do some student trading here and there. Um, we also do a series of seminars that we trade um, amongst our classes so that all of our students get exposed to kind of our global community and get to meet some new people. I've also started some collaboration with a friend of mine and a colleague in Bahrain at the um, Institute of Pearls and Gemstones at Donut. And hopefully again, that will open up some internship opportunities for students we're working with here on campus. And lastly, the two young women in the picture you see are young ladies in my research lab. They are actually downstairs right now with fish in the jar, um, running some temperature experiments. And that's everything I have, thank you. Thank you so much to everybody. Wow, your work is obviously very interesting and very impressive, so thank you. Um, so we do have a good amount of questions in here. So why don't we dive right in? Let's see. Our first question is, how does coral recover from bleaching? Do the fish have to migrate because of the bleaching? And anyone can feel free to, to jump right in and answer. I'll, I'll start um, since I did mention the coral bleaching. So, um, Coral, when it bleaches, it loses its symbiotic algae, which produces more than 90% of its nutrients. And so left bleached for quite a while, the coral effectively starves to death. That being said, there is a lot of evidence to show that, you know, the coral will take up those symbiotic algae if the conditions are right. Unfortunately, when the waters are really warm, that's what causes the the algae to just expel themselves. And as the waters remain warm, they're not likely to go back into the coral. So once the coral bleaches, if left for quite a while, it does pretty much die off. That being said, there's a lot of efforts to restore coral. So they're actually creating coral nurseries where they're growing coral and then placing it on the reef so that it could then spread and hopefully help, to help the reef to recover. When the coral dies, it gets covered by algae oftentimes. And so by getting covered by algae, what ends up happening is, is there's this disruption to the entire food chain with you know, fish near the top of it. So, and to answer the question, I think it was, do fish, what did it say? Do fish 
migrate away, they, they generally do. They'll initially, they'll migrate away because if the coral is gone, all of the things that live on the coral are gone and it just works its way up the food chain. Um, a lot of places that's, that's been a big problem. And a lot of the fish that are leaving are fish that could, when the coral, or sorry, when the algae starts to take over, could actually, you know, help the coral by feeding on the algae, but by then oftentimes it's too late. Great, thank you. And this question is for Kane. Kane, how is your relationship with the commercial fishermen as a scientist guest on their boat? Yeah, so I worked with on the East Coast for two years and that was my first job right out of college. And that was vastly different than my experience in Alaska. Um, because the East Coast fishing didn't grow up with the marine biology program that we have now with NOAA, um, tensions are way higher when you go on the boats on the East Coast. So uh, for, <clears throat> put it bluntly, you step on the East Coast boats and they kind of look at you as a spy for the government. So half of your job is figuring out how to manage this crew and de-escalation because your data can affect their paychecks. Whereas in Alaska, I was going on these boats and the programs grew up together and they are really used to having scientists on all the boats all the time. Uh, the Bering Sea is full coverage. So every boat fishing on the Bering Sea has an observer, uh, someone doing my job on it. Whereas on the East Coast, only about a quarter of the trips are covered up there. So when they're selected and have a marine biologist with them, whether the trip is one day or a month, I mean, that's an extra person you have to feed. The captain has to watch out for their safety. Um, so you're just, your job is not only as a scientist there um, to collect all that data accurately and unbiased, because I mean, you will be pressured sometimes to change your data. Um, but yeah, you, uh, for the most part, it's pretty good. And as long as you can manage people, you'll do pretty all right. Great. Um, and then we have a question for Dr. DeBruzzi. The question is, did you see any animals in Asia that you normally wouldn't see there due to climate change or shifts in the thermal temperatures? Oh, really good question. Um, I don't know that it's due to the change in temperature, but the saltwater frogs we found we're not supposed to be there. We're out of their range for the salt water. And it might be temperature related because I've run temperature experiments with them and they are very thermal tolerant. Um, so I don't know if that's the reason or not, but it's likely. Um, in terms of temperature on the reef fish and that type of, of ecology, I know that we've seen shifts in where the fish are located on the reef and that more of the shallow water areas are not reef habitat that used to be just in the 10 years that I've been going. So I know that's moved the distribution of all of the local animals that are there, um, but I haven't seen anything else that I would consider invasive-ish or out of range. Thank you. Um, we have a few more here that might be specific for some of the students on here. Um, this person's wondering how many students can go on the field studies? So we limit the field studies trip to 12 students, um, mainly because when we're out snorkeling, which we do at least once, usually twice a day, we wanna be able to keep an eye on everyone. And so there's two instructors that teach this course, myself and a botanist in the department, Professor Eric Berry. And so we do try and limit it. And plus, you know, we want, we want it to be kind of an intimate setting so that we can work with each of the students and have, um, the hands-on one-on-one experience as much as possible. And the course is taught every other summer. That makes sense. Um, here's another one. With people wanting tropical fish as pets, have you seen this negatively impact the wildlife population? Is poaching for these animals regulated? I'm gonna take this one if you don't mind. <laughs> um, where I work in Indonesia, there's a lot of collection for the aquatic fish trade. And many of the local fishermen still use what we would consider really barbaric means to collect animals because there's so much money in it. And they bomb fish as well as cyanide fish on the reef to try and collect a handful of animals that might make it to market. In terms of regulation, the Indonesian government does have regulation in place. There's just no availability to enforce regulation across 2000 islands and in really remote areas like where we are in the Wakatobi.
Great, thank you. That's obviously very disappointing to hear, but thank you. Um, see, there's a few here and I know we're running short on time, so I'm gonna try to pick out some of our um, stars here. So this one, Kane, this one might be for you. Why is the Gulf of Maine warming so much faster than other oceans? Um, yeah, I can answer that. So there's a few reasons, you know, one of one of the reasons is, is that the Gulf Stream, which brings warm water up from the south, is moving further north. And as a result of that, the, it's blocking the cold waters that normally come from the Arctic and Greenland that would normally make their way down to cool the Gulf of Maine. So that's one major reason. Another is the Gulf of Maine is relatively shallow compared to other oceans. And so think about like wading in a swimming pool, the shallow waters, the shallow waters warm up faster because the air around it is so warm. So that's another reason. And then it's also somewhat closed off. So the um, it's not, there's not as much cold water coming in from the open ocean that gets into the Gulf of Maine. So it is pretty, se pretty severe as far as the warming for the Gulf of Maine. Thank you. And then this question is, is somewhat related. Have you noticed if the rising sea levels from the melting glaciers affect the animals you study? And if so, how? Yeah, I can hit a little bit of this. So, um, so the sea level rise, one of the biggest problems that we're seeing in Alaska is the, um, the coastal habitats that are farther inland. There's a lot of erosion that's happening because of that rapid rise and wetland flooding. And <clears throat> yeah, it's definitely changing the environment slowly in inland Alaska. And I'm sure I will see those effects on the coast soon too, all over. Okay, and then this question is for Dr. LaPlante and Dr. DeBruzzi. Are you able to bring any of the animals you've studied to St. A's? I have a research permit and an agreement with the Indonesian government, and I have paperwork in triplicate that says I am not allowed to remove samples from the cellular to the tissue to the organism level out of the country. So no. But we do have access to a lot of animals through um, the fish aquaculture trade. So there are animals that I, I purchase so that the students can work with them here. And we do a lot of work with local fish, hopefully, too, in the next year as I get a little bit more familiar with ecology. And we shouldn't under underestimate the power of a couple of goldfish. That's what the young ladies are working in the lab right now with. We learn a lot from animals in terms of understanding their physiology and how an animal works with practice animals. And they're always really good practice. <laughs> Yeah, and similar to what Dr. DeBruzzi said, you know, on the Great Barrier Reef and also in Okinawa where I was doing research, the reefs are protected. So you really can't remove animals from them. Um, so I haven't brought anything back from the tropics, but like Dr. DeBruzzi, we're working on mainly on local animals and I am working on a tropical fish, but it's a freshwater fish that I get in through the aquaculture trade as well. Great, and why don't we wrap it up with one final question. We had an attendee, and this is for everybody. Um, they said, what is the craziest animal you've ever studied? Yeah, I guess I'll start. So I'm a, I'm a big marine mammal guy, and going to Alaska, I've had the opportunity to work with some awesome ones, but um, coming up in the nets, I've got to do necropsies, which are definitely one of my favorite things on a, a 900 pound pilot whale on the East Coast. So that was really cool. I get to do the same thing on a 2,500 pound stellar sea lion out in Alaska. And I've done lots of dolphins, seals, all the good stuff. And that's definitely the favorite part of my job is working with those big marine mammals. I'm gonna go next because I know Dr. DeBruzzi is gonna have something really outrageous with all the animals she works with. So mine's not as outrageous, but the one that comes to mind is when I was doing research in Hawaii, there were these sea cucumbers, which normally are, are very kind of rigid and tough, but these were these tiger cucumbers that were super long and very, very floppy. And <clears throat> I remember picking one up and just being completely shocked at how squishy and kind of floppy it was. So that was the craziest sort of shocking animal that I worked with. I think I'm most lucky to work with the blue ring octopus because nobody does. Um, they're considered super dangerous and it's anticipated just in the Wakatobi that probably three fishermen die every year from, from them. So I consider myself lucky and able to work with those animals and I think they're pretty crazy. 
Well, Lori, you're right. She did end on something crazy. So <laughs> Dr. DeBruzzi, thank you so much. Dr. LaPlante and Kane, thank you so much for joining us tonight. That's all the time we have. I really appreciate you all sharing your experience, your research, your expertise with us. And thank you everyone for joining us tonight. Bye.